Good morning again and welcome to today's webinar. Thank you for joining us. My name is Iris Caldwell. I'm at the Energy Resources Center at the University of Illinois at Chicago. And we facilitate the Rights of Way as Habitat Working Group, which provides a forum for information exchange and the development of best management practices that promote habitat on working landscapes such as utility and transportation rights of way. In addition to webinars like these and connecting people through an, our online community and our working task forces, the working group has semi-annual semi workshops. Our next one is scheduled for February 20th and 21st, 2019, and will be held in Schaumburg, Illinois, which is just outside of Chicago. We're really excited to be holding this meeting in conjunction with the annual meeting of Pheasants Forever and Quail Forever, and we'll have more details in the upcoming meeting to be shared soon. If you're interested in learning more about the working group and our upcoming events, please visit our working group resources page as shown here. We post relevant news, best management practices, planning tools, and other resources to this website. And in a few days, there will also be a link to a recording of this webinar, as well as links to all of our past webinars. As far as logistics today, all attendees have been muted. If you have any technical issues, please use the chat box and we will respond as best as we can. And during the presentation, if you have questions for the presenters, please also type those into the chat box. We've built some time in at the end of the presentation for questions, but please go ahead and submit your questions at any point during the webinar. And finally, as I mentioned before, we will post a recording of this webinar to the Rights of Way as Habitat Working Group's website over the next week or so. Now that we've covered those items, let's turn to our topic for today, which is conservation planning and habitat creation. We're very pleased to have several representatives from Ohio share their experiences with conservation mowing with a specific focus on roadside vegetation management. Michael Redderer will be our primary presenter. Michael is the coordinating wildlife biologist with Pheasants Forever and Quail Forever, and is the state coordinator for the Ohio Pollinator Habitat Initiative. In addition to assisting Ohio DOT with roadside pollinator habitat projects, Mike also works on projects with transmission and gas companies, solar, and various DOTs within the region. Mike has worked with Pheasants Forever and Quail Forever for eight years and has been performing habitat restoration for the last 20 years. Joining Mike is also Joel Hunt and Megan Michael from Ohio DOT, who will provide some additional DOT perspective. Joel Hunt is the Program Administrator for Ohio DOT's Highway Beautification and Pollinator Habitat Program. In addition to coordinating roadside pollinator habitat projects, Joel focuses on litter prevention and abatement, vegetation management, and aesthetic improvements on Ohio's 19,000 miles of roadside. And Joel has worked with the department for 22 years. Megan Michael is an environmental specialist in Ohio DOT's Office of Environmental Services, um, specifically the ecological section, and has been at Ohio DOT for 17 years. As Ohio DOT's ecologist, she performs freshwater mussel and endangered species, stream, and wetland surveys, surveys for federal aid projects and reviews and coordinates projects with resource agencies as part of NEPA compliance. She is the lead ecologist for Section 7 Endangered Species Act, Ohio Programmatic Agreement for the Indiana bat and the Northern Long-Eared bat, as well as freshwater mussel issues. Megan has previously worked for the Ohio Department of Natural Resources and the Ohio Environmental Protection Agency. So we're very excited to have all three of them here for today's webinar. And I'll first turn things over to Joel to help introduce Ohio DOT's Conservation Mowing Program. Thank you, Rios. Good morning, everyone. For decades, ODOT has mowed from the edge of the pavement to the right-of-way fence before every summer holiday and once in the fall. In some areas, we were mowing up to 10 times per year. Thanks in large part to the Rights Away Working Group, Monarch Joint Venture, and Pheasants Forever, this year we implemented a new mowing reduction plan. Going forward, ODOT will only mow back slopes once per year, every other year, or every third year, depending on weed pressure and woody encroachment. This was the most significant policy change in ODOT's recent history, and it received overwhelming support inside ODOT from the media and from the public at large. But it required a lot of intensive communications to pull off. 
Our mowing reduction plan has created 80,000 acres of suitable habitat and saved taxpayers $1.8 million so far this year. Most importantly, we've freed up our highway technicians' time, allowing them to focus on the integrity of our roadways. We have a great partnership with Pheasants Forever that is constantly evolving and maturing, and we hope our story is helpful to you and to your organization. I'd like to introduce Megan Michael. Hello. Um, as most of you know, um, the Monarch was petitioned for listing in 2014, and in December of 2014, Fish and Wildlife gave a substantial 90-day finding saying that they were going to look at listing it. And based on that, um, the federal government had put out, a, or Obama had put out a, a presidential memoranda that federal agencies needed to look at ways of protecting pollinators. Um, through a Section 7 Endangered Species Act, when we started looking at the monarch listing, we realized that pretty much everything ODOT did from mowing and weed eating all the way up through our major projects could potentially harm the monarch if it became listed. We would have potential take on every project and every maintenance that we did. So that was part of the impetus for reduction in mowing. Um, through the reductions in mowing from our states and other states, we were also hoping to preclude needing to list the monarch by bringing back its habitat prior to it becoming rare enough to need listing. And for the first couple years of monitoring, this may be starting to have some impact on raising their uh, populations. So I believe they will make a decision on listing in 2019 in June, and by 2020, if they do decide to list it, that's when it would be listed. Next up is John Ritter, and he's going to give a lot of background on um, the pollinators and how we worked with Business Forever to determine our new mowing schedule. Thank you, Megan, and I want to um, thank Iris with the Right Away Working Group and allowing us the chance, the time to talk, um, to present this information to you, and thank you to all of you for signing in to, to listen to what we are, are looking at doing. I um, wanted to start off with a little bit of a background, um, you know, and kind of uh, pave the way um, and just elaborate more on um, what Megan talked about. Um, essentially, you know, just understanding our pollinators um, and that about 85% of all the world's plants, you know, are essentially uh, depend on pollination. Um, pollinators are essential to our um, ecosystems, our well-being, um, a lot of agriculture, and then our ecosystem health. Um, but at the same time, a lot of our pollinators are um, there's a lot of issues, they're in trouble, um, and we have a lot of decline um, for certain pollinators. Um, and a lot of this is, you know, loss of habitat. Um, there is some, um, uh, um, you know, other issues that we'll discuss here going forward, um, and we'll, we'll look into those here. Give me just a second, it's not progressing. With more than uh, two thirds of, of the agricultural crop species dependent on, you know, pollination, um, that includes a lot of our fruits and nuts and vegetables, um, that essentially works out to about the one out of every three bites of food that we consume are are dominated by, you know, are, are by pollinators. Um, along with that, about 27 billion dollars um, annually comes from um, pollinators within our crop production. Uh, with only about 15% of that um, is, is by our uh, commercially with our domesticated honeybees, uh, the majority of it is by native bees and native pollinators out there on the landscape. Um, and then in addition to our native bees, you know, there's over 800 species of butterflies, 
we've got flies, beetles, bats, butterflies, and even some man, man, mammals are, would be considered um, pollinators. Yeah, there's a little bit of a delay. Um, the number of honeybee colonies um, have also declined since 2006, and there's a lot of various reasons for that. Um, we've got colony collapse disorder, uh, veronomites, and other, um, other diseases that are out there, um, but also the loss of habitat, meaning their nectar and pollen sources, as well as pesticides and other environmental factors. Um, there's a lot of other pollinators out there, you know, along with the honeybees that are following that same course of decline. Um, over 25% of the of North America's bumblebees are in, in stiff decline. Um, for example, rusty patch bumblebee, which is an endangered species listed. Um, and you know, and a lot of that again is that habitat loss. There is some issues with insecticide and pesticides, um, and there's also diseases out there that are contributing factors. Butterflies, um, again, are also in this, in this, in this same um, category. 17% um, of our butterflies are at risk of extinction. Um, and at the same time, um, you know, when we're, when we're in this era and we're talking about the monarch listed, um, you know, 80% of our declines here in the east, um, and then over 50% uh, to the western, the western, um, the monarchs. A lot of it is loss of breeding habitat you know, attributed to loss of milkweed um, from various different practices. Um, but at the same time, we've got lots of other species out there, uh, even hummingbirds uh, uh, following that same course, as well as some of our other migratory songbirds. Bill, can you try clicking on the screen just directly? I want it there. Or yeah, I, I'm clicking. Okay, we can. I'll just say I'll just say enter if you guys can click it. That's fine. Sure. Um, yeah. So. So um, looking at a new direction, and, and okay, so now that's kind of a background. Uh, we understand that there's a lot of significance, a lot of our pollinators in decline. Well, how, how do we fix it and what can we do? Um, you know, along with the B Act that was put out in 2015, um, essentially the Secretary of Transportation basically uh, authorized or encouraged um, DOTs to, to facilitate IVM practices, and, and look at other practices out there that would help, um, you know, encourage encourage pollinator habitat development, um, you know, along the, the roadside mowing, and then also any any other practices that could potentially lead to um, habitat development um, for pollinators. Enter. And and looking at roadsides and why they're so valuable and how they can, you know help this is, you know, they are a landscape level habitat um, opportunity. Um, we've got over 17 million acres of land nationwide that are managed um, by Department of Transportation. Um, you know, that doesn't include other, other right-of-ways that are out there that would even be more numbers on top of that. And essentially, a lot of those are managed um, through mowing or through practices that could be altered with just a little bit of timing um, or, or um, Well, timing and a little bit different alternation to that practice that would be very beneficial to those uh, native flowering plants and grasses uh, and also the pollinators that are out there on the landscape. In addition to, in addition to the benefits um, for the um, pollinators, um, we have also have the benefits of, of maintenance cost. Um, strategic herbicide use and altering those mowing cycles um, simply will lead to, to lower costs. Um, 
And, you know, that's very important because those roadside managers, your staff, and even some of the landscape designers that are employed through some of the DOTs, you know, can benefit pollinators, um, maintain public safety, and also improve, you know, that public perception that's out there, and also educate them along the way. Enter. Okay. Um, so along with the direction that came out from Federal Highways, um, one of, the, one of the things are that ODOT looked at it, like Megan said, is, is what can we do in, in, our, in our area and how we manage things to, to make a change and move forward. Um, so the guidelines were set up. There was a, a research project. Um, Navy, Navy Resource Group was involved. And essentially, we were able to come up with some guidelines that we could provide out through the district level um, to help them just just modify some of the existing way they were doing business out there that would provide some of those pollinator benefits but at the same time would uh would save them um would be cost savings for those districts and those counties um help keep them back on center line um and at the same time um educate and improve um, public awareness enter okay so the main goals of this was to look at um, ODOT essentially looks at it as an IRVM plan or integrated roadside veg vegetation management, um, and so there's a lot of a lot of things that fall into that. It's a pretty broad spectrum, but um, increasing available pollinator resources, um, and we were going to do this by looking at some strategic high visibility areas that had easy access um, for uh, essentially high value pollinator plantings. Um, in lieu of using those traditional roadside mixes, which consistently are dense, cool season grasses, um, is what, what has been used in the past. Um, and at the same time, again, is, is public perception is very important, as everybody in DOTs understands. Um, they're very vocal uh, when things don't look the way they're normally looked at using, but yet we rarely hear from them when, you know, everything's going really nice. But through this program, we've actually heard um, – actually heard from them as some of these changes have been made. Enter. So there's a lot of benefits out there to switching over um, and converting some of those cool season um, areas into uh, native pollinators or through the reduction of the mowing, um, allowing some of those naturalized natives to, to uh, enter the landscape. Um, of over and above being habitat and providing those nectar and pollen sources for, for pollinators. They're also ecological, ecologically beneficial through providing, um, you know, they help stabilize the soil um, through their extensive root systems. Um, they also help with stormwater infiltration, runoff, and even, and even are known to sequester carbon. They're also well adapted. It's, they've evolved over many, many years. Um, you know, on these landscapes, so they can survive areas through drought. Um, they are very good at uh, utilizing what nutrients are in the soil, so they do not usually need amendments. Um, as well as being deep rooted, they since they gather their uh, minerals and water through many many layers of the soil, um, they're really good at stabilizing that and can be used for uh, erosion prevention sites. Um, <clears throat> And then also, um, over time, they can be very competitive in this pool of soil, so uh, they can actually outcompete um, some of the unwanted areas or do very well, or some of the traditional mixes do not um, work very well. Enter. This one is just simply uh, a good diagram um, to understanding that root system that's out there through native plants and, you know, the, the species that are there is really relatively unimportant for this uh, diagram. But if you'll notice on the far left hand side, um, there's a little green sliver with a little bit of black underneath it. And that typically represents the normal turf grasses that are used out there on the landscape. And you can see those, those minimal inches of root systems, why they are prone to, um, they're quick to establish, but at the same time, they're, they're very prone to drought issues. They're prone to erosion issues, you know, once soil gets moving, things like that. Um, if soil quality is poor, they don't do very well, and you need a lot of amendment in those first few inches of the soil. Whereas the native forbs, whether it be gra or native grasses, have extensional root systems, usually from 3 to 20 feet, depending on the species. Um, 
can really help with that. So as described with uh, with the, the erosion benefits um, and not needing a lot of amendments, you can see why now um, from that diagram. Enter. So, so cost savings. Um, when we look at you know the benefits of these of these roadside you know management practices, they'll provide cost savings over over time. Um, when we look at um, what ODOT, and this is just in Ohio, what they currently own and manage is just over 290,000 acres of right-of-way. Um, you know, and, as, and, and outside of the clear zone or the safety zone, whatever you may look at, that, that 15 or 30 feet or whatever you have set up based off of your function class, um, you know, those, those areas, you know, in the past mowed four or five times a year, as Joel mentioned, up to 10 times in some of the urban areas. Um, just simply reducing those mowing cycles and reducing those mows is a cost savings just right there. Um, with ODOT, they're just under six million dollars a year uh, maintaining those 290,000 acres, and that is just you know from the pavement to the fence. That doesn't include any of the any of the stuff that they do within the um, the actual roadway itself. Um, but again, by removing those those mowing, changing those schedules, reducing that. Um, using some of the um, strategic herbicides on those areas are definitely going to reduce some of those costs. And I believe Joel mentioned $1.8 million so far um, since the program has been rolled out this year. Um, so savings with that, you know, with the cost savings, the ecological benefits, the reduction of stormwater damage, potential erosions, um, I think you're painting a clear, clear picture of how these uh, alternative um, native plantings or revegetation along highways can be very beneficial. Enter. But we have to convince not only ourselves, but we also have to convince the public, you know, that this is the right way to do. Um, we know we've listed here some of the financial function and ecological benefits, but again, they may look at some of these areas. They're not completely mowed. They're not manicured like they used to be. So they may look at them as being weedy or unkept. So we'll go through here in a few minutes, but you know, there's lots of different techniques and, and ways to put out there for them, um, helping them understand you know, what it is um, and addressing that public perception, having those announcements ready to go, um, having frequently asked questions and fact sheets um, for people that may be taking those calls. is gonna be very important moving forward because it's a different way of doing business um, and it is going to take some time for everybody um, to buy in that, both out of house and in house. Enter. So aesthetically, um, once we're looking at some of these areas, I mean, you've got to, um, you know, take into account that a lot of these are going to your 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 forbs are your flowering species. So there's going to be you know colors throughout there throughout the year. Um, if this is a naturalized area, you may you may have less. You may have more of the same colors in your high value pollinator areas or targeted areas that where you actually do plantings and interseedings. Um, you know, that's some of the techniques that go into when you're planting those and where to put them because of those colors that you're gonna have out there. Um, and that also plays in, you know, to the benefits of the pollinators themselves. Um, through federal highways, some of the information they have out there, you know, some of these studies that they've done has even showed um, that the motors prefer um, these native areas or wildflower meadows and things along the roadside to look up as they break up their long commutes. Enter. But addressing some of those questions, um, you know, one of the ones that always comes up first is, is wildlife concerns. You know, by establishing these, are we going to be creating issues? Um, to those same, there are studies out there um, that also indicate that you know it does not increase deer-related collisions. That's one of the one of the most asked questions we had here in Ohio when we first discussing this. Um, and some of the reasons are is when you maintain that clear zone, that that first 15 or 30 feet, you know, essentially that mowed area um, in, keeps your line of sight open. Um, but the vegetation after that. Um, you know, it's not as palatable to a lot of, uh, uh, you know, to deer. They like a lot of that fresh, young, tender stuff. So as that stuff matures, it is it's less palatable. It is less likely to have large scale, you know, feedings, um, keeping them further away from the roadway, less likely to bolt and will remove linearly with the highways because they feel protected. Um, and that's just what some of the results of, of those studies have shown. Um, 
enter. But not only do we have to address the public perception, um, we need to make sure that the, that the staff um, at all levels understand what's taking place, educating them on why things are happening, what's actually going to be done in each instance. They're your first line of contact with the public. And so if they don't have buy-in or understand exactly what's going on, um, then it's hard to expect, you know, the public to understand it as well. Um, this also works very well because it gives them, you know, a new sense of what's going on. Um, and even some of the staff that we have worked with, you know, take, take pride in what they're doing. They take ownership of these projects. Um, you know, and, and it's something a little bit different for them and, and they really, really enjoy uh, doing the work. And they're your greatest advocates then when they, when they talk to the public. They live in these communities, they see them at churches, at social functions, at school things, and just out in the public and can help get that message out there. Next. Or enter. So uh, garnering that support and things, there's many things that you can do out there. Um, social media right now, you know, is one of the easiest ways to get information out there, um, whether it be through Facebook or Twitter or different types of accounts. Um, signage is very important. Um, having, you know, in progress signs in local places to let the community know that this is not just something that's being let go, that there is a plan, there is a process being done. Um, and doing press releases or even having um, open house meetings, um, having PSAs on, on radios and things like that um, are very uh, important. I know some states and some areas have also done license plates, wildflower bookouts. Um, Ohio has done some seed packet handouts and dis distributions, as well as information at rest stops. Um, we've created some pollinator areas at the rest stops that kind of educate the, the public as they're traveling through to see what's going on. It's representative of what, what they're going to see along the landscape. Um, and talking with working groups, you know, farmers, extension offices, believe it or not, the agricultural industry is very interested in pollinators and what's going on. Uh, a lot of them are, are advocates of what's also helping, um, and sometimes they can be your biggest supporters, um, depending on what information is out there for them. Next. So, there's the background and kind of the, the goal. So, so what's next in implementation? How do we actually get this out there on the light on the landscape? So, understanding plant life cycles, and you know, and 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 the nesting seasons and the bloom periods and everything, and how that all relates to mowing, kind of kind of sets up, you know, what we're going to do. So, mow. We all understand that mowing is a very very important of what DOTs do. Um, and actually, it's very important in a lot of right away groups um, through vegetation management. Um, but understanding that that goes hand in hand with uh, IVM practices as well, um, strategic herbicide uses. It's, it's, it's a package deal. They work very well together. Mowing, and again, it's used in these safety and clear zones. And I just can't stress that more. By no means are we uh, advocating to, you know, not maintain those line of sight or those clear zones because that's very, very um, instrumental here in Ohio um, to maintain those open areas where we can see it. Um, but it, and it does some also some beneficials is it gives you those nice, neat edges to where it keeps things from looking very unkept. Um, but also those are going to be used for you know woody vegetation. Um, I know a lot of states, some of the woody, some of the uh, more forested states, that uh, early succession is an issue as well as wildflower, wildfires um, can be an issue. So we know that reducing fuel loads is an important part of that, and that's understandable. And then also trying to, rate, or trying to control um, undesirables, invasive species, or non-native vegetation. Um, those are all, all good uses of mowing. Um, but what we have to understand is sometimes when and how we do something can be as important as what we do. So doing things at the wrong time or at the wrong height um, can have severe impacts, um, unadvertent impacts on certain things. So that's what we're looking at discussing here um, with this roadside vegetation plan. Enter. So adjusting mowing practices. Um, it's very, very cost effective. Um, it's essentially easy. It's, it's one of those things where we're not purchasing anything additive. Um, all we're doing is looking at when we mow now currently and how we can affect that and what timelines can we look at, at doing those in. Um, it can be done 
um, without any increasing of hazards uh, to drivers um, and public disapproval um, if done right. Again, a lot of those surveys out there have shown that drivers prefer looking at some of this naturalized vegetation or pollinator areas uh, during commutes as opposed to long, long drawn out stretches of turf grass. <clears throat> and mowing affects pollinators in, in, in a couple different ways. Um, you know, not only can you um, hurt uh, pollinators um, as far as during the mowing practice by damaging caterpillars or larvae, um, their young that they're trying to reproduce, but, but the biggest impact is removing that, that flower and nectar source or that nectar and pollen source, what they feed on, what they need to eat. Um, you know, that's, that's the biggest impact that mowing has, um, uh, especially continued mowing, uh, continual mowing. So just a little bit of adjustments to those timing and frequencies can really reduce some of those negative impacts. Enter. All right, so how can it be adjusted? Um, you know, essentially reducing the routine mowing, fence to fence. Again, our clear zone in Ohio is roughly side, uh, edge of pavement to ditch, 15 to 30 feet in most cases. Um, and then we're essentially talking that ditch to the to the fence, the property fence. Um, reducing those mowings in those areas a couple times a year, um, or once a year, once every year, once every third year, depending on what kind of influence those have, um, are, are going to depict, are going to be help um, dictate that schedule for you. Um, and then those whatever times you're not doing mowing, you're also going to have that partner IVM plan in place for those areas. Uh, to help treat some of those um, unwanted plants. But maintaining that regular mow zone, again, is most important um, out there on the landscape and keeping those safety zones. Enter. So here's a quick diagram that kind of just, you know, describes a little bit. Um, in Ohio, we only have a couple sites that we actually have any kind of habitat in or working in the, in the median. Most of ours is that zone three or four um, outside the outside the clear zone of, of two that occurs on most of the highways. Enter. So adjusting the mowing schedule, um, I can give you what we did here in Ohio, um, and a lot of it's based off of because our growing season starts April May. Once temperatures get into that average 50 degree range. And typically, uh, most of our native plants uh, qu quit growing and start to shut down in, in September, uh, mid to late September. And, and any work that we do within that growing season is going to impact um, pollinators and wildlife in one way or the other. Um, so we try to um, adjust what we do and do as little as possible during nesting seasons, um, as well as the growing season. Enter. So the map, this is, um, you know, this is one of the maps put out, and this is through MJV. Um, I know Fish and Wildlife Service had a lot of, a lot of help in putting out these recommendations. So in Ohio, um, right in the center there, we are kind of in a, a light tan and yellow. We're split pretty much right down the center of the state there along I-70. So we have two mowing periods. But essentially what this allows is early season and late season mowing. And then in each group, no matter where you're at in the country, um, it does show you that there is an in-season or a growing season maintenance um, time period, whether it's July or June 20th through July 10th or June 30th through August, depending on where you're at. Um, there is a management time. So for maybe a high visibility site or some other areas that you definitely need to, to do some work in, there is, there is a mid, there is a growing season management window that would be least packful um, for monarch butterflies. And that would, that would also attribute to a lot of other pollinators out there. Enter. So um, this is just a kind of diagram to go up there to understand is that, you know, you don't have to do work on every acre all the time. So when we're looking at adjusting um, our mowing schedule, the odd and even year, that could be north and south, north, the north side of a road or the south side of the road, um, or if you have a large, um, large back slope area, um, you know, you could mow from halfway or from the fence and then halfway towards the road one year and then mow from the ditch to that same point the next year. Um, there's going to be many, many, many variations in this. And it's just making sure that there's habitat out there at all times for everything um, and just understand the concept. We don't have to mow every acre all the time. Enter. Enter. 
So reducing impacts on pollinators, these can be done in a couple different ways. Um, spot mowing. So again, if there's areas out there that you have patches of weed or issues or some, uh, some growth from woody vegetation, by all means, go out there and address those when they need to be addressed. Uh, it just doesn't mean that the whole, the whole area needs to be, needs to be um, mowed all at once. Um, and mowing heights. You know, heights are 10 inches or more um, in most recommendations. And that's for a couple of different reasons. Um, for vegetation-wide, especially on our natives, uh, understanding that they are a very stemmy plant with leaves scattered throughout the stem, um, unlike the uh, turf grasses, which is all leaves. Um, if you mow them very short, you're left with just a stem, and it takes a lot of the root reserves from them to regrow leaves to produce uh, food, uh, then to go keep going through the process. So that can weaken those stands of natives. Um, and at the same time, if you're at those height levels, um, you're cutting less and less. You're usually cutting mainly the reproductive part of grasses and flowers at that point, so you're not moving a lot of uh, material. So it's less wear and tear on your mowers. Uh, you can mow faster, um, less fuel use, things like that, plus uh, debris. Uh, you're less likely to catch a lot of those lowing debris and cause damage um, or potential risk of, of, of flying stuff onto the roadways. And then one of the other ones is when do we do our mowing? Um, not by timing of the year, but timing of the day, you know, try to do when, when pollinators are least, um, or not avoid mowing when they're less active, meaning early mornings and evenings, um, you know, more during the day when they're uh, flight ready and, and things can move around to avoid the equipment. Answer? Okay, um, so again, mentioning that this is a lot of this is going on to um, herbicides is an integral part of any mowing reduction plan because you're going to have to have this as part of the IVM, Integrated Vegetation Management. And then, you know, because a lot of time herbicides are what we're going to need to control those invasive weeds, um, unwanted plants, woody vegetation, um, or we can use them in various other ways like through uh, suppression. Uh, those undesirables, you know, using growth regulators and different things. So understanding that, you know, if we just use them indiscriminately, um, you know, broad spectrum herbicides, you know, we aren't really controlling what we're doing. We're just doing more broad spectrum and we could have a lot of those indirect effects, um, not only removing floral resources and host plants, but potentially um, having some toxicity to introduce directly to pollinators. And those broad uses of herbicides can also weaken some of those uh, desirable stands, removing them, making them weaker, uh, same thing as mowing them too short could do. And then that opens up areas and potentially allows for unwanted vegetation um, to come in. And there are a number of steps that we look at this um, out there that we can benefit you know, from that. I'm not gonna go into all those, but uh, a lot of that can be from our equipment that we have, nozzles, doing it the right regulation, the right tank mixes, things like that. Um, but in the end, again, it's all reduced, goes into long-term maintenance costs, and by strategic uses, we can help keep that cost lower. Enter. So um, the big benefit is understanding selective herbicides to non-selective herbicides. Non-selective herbicides are like you're all killing like Roundups, things like that, using glyphosate just indiscriminately. But using selective herbicides to target the weeds or the weeds family or the weed group that we're going after, um, understanding that there are actually a lot of chemicals out there that we can use to control unwanted vegetation and actually doesn't hurt some of our natives, um, grasses and flowers, or targeting grass and not a broadleaf or just going after broadleaf. Um, by doing that, has a lot of additive benefits. Next. So one of the things, it's, it's a real quick, easy thing to do um, that we did here in Ohio, working with um, OSU Extension, Ohio State University Extension Office, which is kind of our authority in the state with, with herbicide use um, uh, through the agricultural community. Um, so they get lots of recommendations. We just looked at our most common weeds and then worked with them to put together kind of a chemical list and rates and the best time to treat those so that the, that the county and the township um, um, managers could work with their uh, production or their suppliers uh, to come up with either uh, uh, herbicides or tank mixes that would target what they wanted to um, and have the least adverse effect on the landscape. Enter. 
So understanding our, um, and using our herbicides for our noxious weed control, um, understanding too is, is when we pull these mowers back and you do less mowing, um, there's going to be some areas where some of those may have been in the past, but they just haven't been visible because they were routinely mowed. Um, so we're going to be, you know, those first couple years, um, your efforts are going to be higher. And then as we move forward um, and start getting control on those over time, a lot of that stuff's going to be reduced down. And then, you know, understanding that we are going to need to use them, but uh, label is the law and following those proper use and, and best strategic practices um, will have the least likely uh, ill effects on our pollinators um, and their plants or nectar sources. Enter. So we, we've got to identify those problem areas like I mentioned before. Um, so now that uh, some of those areas aren't going to be mowed as often and we know that we're going to have some potential areas, whether it be woody vegetation or um, noxious or undesirable weeds, um, we can catalog those areas, come up with a plan, get out there and start to strategically um, target those, you know, and again, prioritizing sites, you know, going after your largest areas first and then coming back to your smaller spotty areas. Enter. And choosing the appropriate herbicide for the job, um, you know, picking out that, that, that plant, that group that you need, whether it's a broadleaf, whether it's a grass, um, and then what chemicals could be used in that area um, to have the least likely effect um, on pollinators in the habitat or on the environment themselves. Um, that all goes into this target. And some of the ways to look at that are, enter. It is getting this broken down into what I'm going to do. So this is just a quick diagram of, okay, so now we've kind of looked on the landscape out there, what, what weed problems, what woody vegetation do we have? What's our, what's our best, um, best avenue for control? Um, what herbicide do we want to use? What are we trying to target? To try to get you those ideas to start thinking about herbicides, timing, um, and what, what can be done. Next. And understanding timing too, just like mowing, when we do something can have completely different effects on vegetation as even what we do or at what rates we do it. Um, so just in the diagram, if you look at that, you know, this is typical Canada thistle. Um, they spread a lot by rhizomes, they're very connected. Um, so you could go through there and flower stage and sp spray, but as you can see, there are very small plants or plants that haven't popped through the, the soil yet or even plants that are coming up out of the root systems that even though you sprayed it once, um, that's not going to target. So a lot of times for specific weeds, multi-seasons uh, approach are needed as well as as, as, as sometimes potentially different chemicals um, to have those same effects. Next. So this is, a, this is our last slide for the presentation, and I like ending on this one because it just gets us a better understanding of timing and why is that so important. So essentially understanding that uh, when a plant is in dormancy, nothing's really happening. It has reserves stored in its root system, but there's really nothing going on above the ground. So it's really not an ideal time to spray because we're essentially, there is no movement um, into the root systems. So we're really even not gonna remove the plant because it's not processing. Um, it's not photosynthesizing. So we're not gonna get any cellular breakdown. Enter. So also understanding when things first green out, um, is, this, is this the best time to spray things? Because as you see from that, it's sending stuff from its root systems to its leaves. Any, any herbicide out here is essentially, it'll kill or brown up where it contacts, but there's not a whole lot going beneath the ground. So it's more of an out of sight, out of the mine or a chemical mow. Doesn't mean that that plant has been removed from the landscape. You just visibly can't see it and it will reappear. And I think we've all seen that out there on the landscape from time to time. Enter. Also, then there's the flowering or the fruit production when it's making seed heads or it's producing fruit or it's producing flowers. It's still sending stuff up from the root reserves to that. Most of what it's making as far as food is going for production um, to get it to that reproductive stages. Now, there are some plants like Phragmites that this is actually the time to do it. So understanding your plant and your cycle and what you wanna do is important um, for this timing. But for most plants, Senescence is the time that you really want to target that because if you look at the diagram 
all the food that's being generated from the leaves is going deep down in the root systems to basically prepare it for dormancy so that has enough res root, enough root reserves for leaf out the next growing cycle. This is when you get the most control um, on these unwanted species because you're actually uh, contributing to the root sources and stressing it. I do it after this over a couple year period for some of those really tough plants, it essentially reduces it down to the point where they just don't have enough reserves or enough energy to sprout back up and then it's just a spot spraying from that point. Um, so I'm going to end there. Um, this will allow us about 15 minutes or so for questions. Um, I hope you all enjoyed the presentation. I'm sure there's going to be lots of questions out there and we look forward to answering those. But again, thank you for taking the time to, uh, to uh, observe this webinar um, from some of our um, observations um, and issues that we've had here through in Ohio um, and with the Department of Transportation. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Mike. Um, we've gotten a lot of good comments and questions as you've been talking. Um, definitely some folks um, agreeing with some of the remarks you're making and, um, and some of the challenges that you've identified. So um, we'll spend a little bit of time here going through questions. Again, if you have others, please continue to submit them through the chat box um, and we'll hopefully have time to address them. If there's any questions we don't get to today, um, we can follow up by email. Um, but just starting back with one of the early topics um, you touched on, Mike, was um, the cost savings. Um, and so we had one question that was whether or not um, that cost savings considered the cost of native seed um, in your overall analysis. Okay, well, first of all, the cost savings that was given, like we've experienced with ODOT, none of that includes any of the, any of the uh, rehabilitation or uh, natural, or I'm sorry, the restoration sites that we've done. That was essentially cost savings from removing um, the frequency of the mowing and the areas in which we were mowing that time. So that was essentially from that $5.86 million annually that they typically use, um, reducing about $1.8 million was just for the roadside mowing reduction. Um, just that. Uh, to address the cost of native seed, <laughs> um, this is a great topic for me. I get very passionate about it. Essentially, from my experience working with uh, DOTs, energy, and right-of-ways, uh, their mixes, I don't see a significant difference between the cost of a cool season grass mix at 200 pounds per acre uh, to our highly diverse native seed mix because, one, we're designing those off of seeds per square foot to get the most impact in the general area. Um, and we're, we've been building them comparable to what the existing mixes were. And then if there is any extra seed cost, a lot of that is retained from the, that you're not using the amendments, you're not having to do the fertilizer um, and even some of the prep work that's out there. But overall, where the biggest benefit is, is if you take a 10 acre infield that's planted to fescue that you mow four or five times a year, or even if you mow it three times a year, uh, trying to reduce that down. You do a native planting, maybe it costs you $400 an acre to establish it. Your mowing is going to be less even over time because a lot of times you're, not, you're only going to be doing spot mowing once those get established. So what you lose on the front end, more than likely you'll gain, um, gain back and then some over the long-term long -term maintenance savings. Okay, great. And then just as a reminder, can you um, remind us what was the, at the end of the day, what was the total reduction in mowing that you've seen in Ohio? So, uh, well, essentially from the mowing reduction, um, it's equated to there's 80 acres in the state that is now under roadside mowing reduction plan. And those are the acres from the ditch to the fence, not, not the ones that we're doing the, um, the clear zone mowing on and not any areas that fall within the urban areas. Um, those are just maintained areas, and Joel with DOT would like to address that. Yeah. So specifically to answer your question, Iris, it's been a $1.8 million savings so far this year. And when we did our mowing re reduction plan and vetted this with um, leadership, um, we had decided as a team to implement it over two years. Um, originally, we had intended this summer to be our secondary routes, those state and U.S. routes outside municipalities. Uh, followed by next year on our priority routes. Um, and in combination um, with both years, 
um, are our, our outside mowing contracts. A lot of our contracts are lap for two years at a time. So that's where we're going to see really our biggest cost savings, and um, we should start seeing that next year into the following year. Um, so uh, when we were vetting this and we were talking with the, the leadership, um, a lot of our districts and county managers just decided um, since this is all ready to go, let's go ahead and do both systems this year. So um, the $1.8 million um, is not really a true um, accurate picture of what we'll see because it really, um, we rolled this out and it became effective in late May. So we're only talking about half the growing season. So um, of that $5.86 million that Mike had mentioned, um, we should be fairly close to that when you consider contract mowing as well. Okay, great. Thank you for the additional clarification. Um, can either of you address um, the effectiveness of these types of management practices in highly urban areas? Well, yeah, um, so in the, so the urban areas don't fall within this for the most part of as, as a state well, as a state whole. We have some areas that we've worked with um, the local uh, municipalities or the local um, has control over some of those areas, and we are still doing these practices as well as some restoration in those areas, putting in those high value pollinators, um, also doing even even stages above that where they're considered gateway communities and beautification areas and, and, and ODOT has a different different side which is the beautification that Joel is also um, also in, in, in charge of. Yep. And just to add to that, um, and Mike alluded, we whenever possible enter into a public-private partnership, uh, whether it be a corporation, a conservation group, or a lo local municipality. Um, the total we've come up with per acre is about $400 to establish a new pollinator habitat uh, per acre, 400 per acre. Um, and so in um, several instances so far since um, 2017, um, you know, we've entered into these public-private partnerships where um, groups will pay the labor equipment and materials, and all they ask for in exchange is the use of our right-of-way and a recognition sign. Um, and so this program can only get as big as uh, Mike and me and, and our partners. So um, whenever possible, bringing other people in to help carry that um, load and, um, you know, having other stakeholders um, in it with us, um, we see this will be a more sustainable long-term program. Great. Thank you. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, the threatened and endangered species question, um, and in particular, you know, the potential impact of establishing milkweed, milkweed along a roadside, um, and if that'll cause additional complications um, as you move forward? Um, part of that, uh, ODOT has handled by um, entering into a conservation a candidate conservation with assurances plan with Fish and Wildlife, which is ongoing. And that agreement will protect ODOT from um, the, our potential harm for our uh, maintenance activities on our roadways. So that was uh, the easiest way to address it because even if we did keep everything mowed tight all the way to the fence, uh, we have a lot of roadways where that's just not possible because we have woods close by or the right away is narrow and we have flowering resources very close to our road where we would still have impacts just by having a road on the landscape from car strikes and from, you know, accidental mower strikes and stuff like that. So instead of going through it and saying, no, we're just going to scorch earth the whole thing to keep them off the right of way, we realized that that wasn't possible and instead of doing that we went through the we've joined through other right-of-way members such as utilities DOTs and others to come up with a way to work with Fish and Wildlife so that we are not having to coordinate for every small impact on our road, roadways and then Iris one other point on that is that map that we showed um, for that with those uh, mowing schedules and things like that. That is typically when we're trying to do, um, the, you know, any, any of the work out there. Um, 
and so those those are the dates that you know even once we we are assumed not not assuming but I guess some of the thing is is those are still going to be working those, that before that late and then that one management zone that even if things go um, for a listing those are those are more than likely going to be the um, the dates in which you can perform activities uh, with the least uh, amount of effect. So those are going to be acceptable dates if if you know to do management activities. I do have one. Oh, more. sorry, Megan has one more comment. One more quick point is that in Ohio we're adding 80,000 approximate acres of new habitat to the uh, landscape that does not exist right now. Uh, in those cases, the reproduction that occurs on those 80,000 acres will much more add to these populations than the occasional car strike will reduce them. Great, thank you. Um, and kind of to that effect, um, we had a question that just came in about the overall percentage of roadways um, that will be enrolled in this um, reduced mowing um, program. Uh, what will be the phase process over time? So when we, um, you know, have been working with this group on the um, CCAA, um, it was determined that DOTs should shoot for an 8% um, conservation uh, practices on 8% of their total acres. And so uh, one quick correction to uh, an earlier slide, Mike had, we have 260,000, not 290,000 acres. And so that equates roughly to 20,800 acres that we're putting into conservation. And interestingly, when we first started down this path back in 2016, 2017, um, we had thought about um, just, you know, establishing these high value pollinator habitats as a way of tackling the problem. And um, like Megan said, you know, through these conservation mowing practices, we've, um, you know, come up with 80,000. So that far exceeds the 20,800 acres that we're committing to through the CCAA. Great. Um, and I'll just pipe in and add that um, the CCAA that both Joel and Megan have referred to um, is an effort that we've been working on through the Rights of Ways Habitat Working Group. Um, so if you're interested in more information about that, um, please feel free to reach out to me. This is Iris Caldwell speaking, um, and I can provide more information. Okay, um, we have a couple of questions regarding available resources. Um, do you have any recommendations for um, any manuals for integrated vegetation management or the selection of um, herbicides for specific plants? Well, I'll, yeah, so that would kind of go a couple different directions. Number one, it's going to depend on their state and their region. Um, if you want to direct those questions directly to me or, or give out my email address to those folks, um, we can help them find some resource, you know, like local resources, whether it's through extension or through other sources in their state. Um, Cause it's all, it's all different. Like we have OSU extension, Purdue does another good one, but then in some of the other states, it's through their department of agriculture and things like that. So um, we'll, we'll help connect them at least as far as, you know, the, that, that type of stuff. Um, and, and and that's mainly going to be the herbicide um, type stuff. Um, IVM, there's lots of stuff out there, but it's all over the board um, because it depends on your definition of IVM. Uh, mainly on this one with conservation mowing, targeting that as 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 a component of that IVM and packaging that, that together with the herbicide. Again, it would be more linking them up with what state they're in to understanding when their conservation mowing schedule would be, and then helping you know coordinate or helping locate what serve or what um, office I guess is responsible for their herbicide in their state. Okay, great. Thanks, Mike. Um, and we do have um, all three of your email addresses up on the screen here. Um, so if you have follow-up questions, please feel free to reach out to Joel, uh, Megan, or Mike. Um, we had another couple of questions related to some of the mowing transitions in particular. Um, so there was a question specifically about whether or not the mowers had to be modified um, to the 10 inch height, um, and specifically if that increased um, any additional time um, due to either the height or the density of actually mowing um, at that reduced frequency. 
Um, yeah, so the, the quick answer is no. Um, that, was a, that was a good question that we had here when we first started rolling out the plan. Um, they were worried that they would have to adjust chain length, and then if they were mowing on slopes, then chains could potentially get into mowers and, and, and um, you know, tangle with the blades and things like that. But understanding as vegetation is, so on, on bat wings or three-point or depending on what they are, um, essentially, it's 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 most of those. It's mowing them at their highest, uh, the highest. And I know at some point those things have been set, either with a um, just like a stop, or um, you know some people have gone more and they put a, a like a bolted type stop so that can't go too low, or I'm sorry, too high, or or vice versa. So a lot of it's just minor adjustments to the thing. It's really nothing mechanical or costly. Um, it's just adjusting um, those stops where they are. But understanding too is, is as you move up and you're mowing higher, um, that curtain is for anything that's gonna blow and move. Um, you're less likely going to have debris, so there's less of that. But at the same time as you have all that vegetation from 10 inches to the ground, and that's usually your thicker vegetation, um, the reason those chains are there to keep like large things from moving is as you're mowing those, you're removing that kind of that, that vegetative curtain, which allows for debris to flow. So what we've seen is it doesn't increase um, you don't have to increase your chain because the vegetation itself um, also helps keep the debris from blowing low under the mower. Um, but with that height, again, you're moving a lot less of vegetation, debris, or anything like that. So we have not really seen any significant movement of material. And, and just to add to that, that was quite honestly one of our struggles when we rolled this out to the counties was um, hitting that uh, 10 to 12 inch mow, mowing height. Um, a lot of people I think we'll get to that point, but right now they're looking at six to eight inches is where they're mowing. Um, I will give one word of um, warning though that we've encountered. So when you have that taller vegetation, um, you're going to encounter utility pole strikes. Um, that's one concern. Um, so that's going to increase the number of claims from contract mowers. And also we had um, a tractor roll over because they were um, they hadn't scouted the site before they went out. Um, but when that taller vegetation is um, is on those back slopes, those steep back slopes, and um, you know there's a little depression um, in the slope, whether it be from erosion or what have you, caught the wheels and it rolled over. So those are a couple of things to keep in mind. And um, going forward, we're looking at um, putting flags on our utility poles, um, and I'm talking about the posts for um, for telecom, um, so we so our mowers can see that. Good words of caution. Um, one last question, and then we'll wrap up for today. Um, we haven't been able to get to all of the questions, um, and so we can follow up by email um, after the webinar. Um, but I'm hoping that you guys could talk a bit about this question of seeding versus utilizing um, this existing seed bank, um, and how you envision um, that affecting pollinator habitat um, as you move forward. And in particular, if that has any implications on managing invasive species. Okay, um, well, they're definitely two distinctive uh, separations. So our native seed bank and naturalized areas, that's essentially, that's what falls into the areas that you would be um, mainly performing a lot of the IVM, which is from your ditch to fence, um, outside your clear zone all the way to the property fence. Um, and a lot of that is, so So yes, there's going to be invasive species in that area, and then we're going to target them, but that's kind of what some of the presentation was, is once those, once you can see what um, vegetation is, is in those areas, um, now that some of that mowing has been, has been set back to allow some of those, uh, that vegetation to reach, to reach um, heights and maturity, you can identify them, uh, you can also then catalog those and then become a plan to go after those. And that all comes into that timing in those Septembers and when it is, because most of our noxious weeds, uh, at least in our region, in Ohio, and it'd be different by region, and we'd love to, you know, love to discuss it with them, but most of our invasives are, are active early in the year and then, you know, really late in the year. That's why they're invasive. And then if you looked at the slide, it talks about our growing season. Most of our natives have started shutting down in, say, mid to late September. So really in most year, it gives us October and early into November to target um, herbicide applications on those unwanted vegetations with minimal or no effect on our native population or our native vegetation that we're trying to, to increase. So by doing this and using the right herbicides at the right timing, you can actually slowly remove 
the unwanted vegetation. First, it would be noxious weeds. And then even then, as some of this becomes more naturalized and you get native grasses and native flowers or forbs out there, um, you know, they'll, they'll compete well. And then you can even start removing some of the cool season grass vegetation in those areas to allow more room. So it's more of a transition over time, letting it naturalize with the help of selective herbicides or, you know, targeting uh, management practices throughout that time. The planting is usually something that we look at. It's a high value pollinated area. We're looking at high visibility sites, um, easy access, and you know, decent acres to where they can be beneficial. A lot of those would be connecting other habitat sites out there um, and more strategic. Right now, we're targeting most of our large infields where our on and off ramps for our you know, highways are. Um, because they're easy access, it's a cost savings to the local district um, and, and county garages uh, that they don't have to maintain. Um, and, and for public reasons, we've got the signs up and everybody can see what's going on. So over this change, it's helping spread the word of what we're doing. And I would just add to that, maybe just to summarize that, um, you know, all of these things work well. And so um, what we try and do as a program is be as diverse as possible. And so those public-private partnerships you know, using um, the land on our uh, facilities um, to establish pollinator habitat, um, urban gateways, um, you know, linear corridors, um, you know, interchanges, um, and as well as our mowing reduction practices um, kind of give us, um, you know, a, more of a sustainable long-term um, approach to um, continuing our program because there are no certainties, especially, um, you know, we're a government agency and, um, it could be the will um, of any administration to change the way we've, we're currently doing things. And so um, by having lots of um, diverse ways of managing our roadsides, um, I, I see this as being um, a key to long-term success. Great. Well, I want to thank everyone for their time today for this webinar, um, and especially Mike, Joel, and Megan for taking time to share your experiences um, again, if you have follow-up questions, please feel free to reach out to them. Um, if we didn't get to your question today, um, we will follow up with you separately. Um, and just as a final reminder, um, we will be posting a recording of this webinar um, to the Rights Away's Habitat Working Group's website, um, and we'll send an email out to you all um, when that's available. So thanks again, and have a great afternoon.